Okay, we'll look in the book. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31. Verse 30 says, Thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Verse 22 says, Moreover the Lord said unto Moses, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of sweet cinnamon. And then he goes on uh, to Calamus. And verse 24, Cassia. And in verse 25, thou shalt make it an oil of holy anointing, anointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith and the ark of the testimony. I'm sorry, chapter 30. Now after this, this is the anointing, is the anointing ointment that has to be put on the inanimate things, the furniture in the tabernacle, and then also on the general congregation. But then there's a changeover when we come down to... Uh, let me read, uh, verse, 30 Let me read uh, verse 30 again, sorry. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh it shall not be poured. Neither shall ye make any other like it, after the holy composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. The Lord said unto Moses, Take unto these sweet spices, these are strange names, Stacti, Onica, and Galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, and each shall be like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume of confection after the art of the apothecary, Temper together pure and holy, and thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put of it before the testimony of the tabernacle of the congregation. I was reminded of this today for a number of reasons. <coughs> I believe it's in the fourth chapter of Luke, you remember there, that Jesus had gone through the forty days of temptation and trial. And then he went to the temple and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. I don't believe he would have gone through that temptation without that anointing. And it says he returned from the trial of 40 days full of the Holy Ghost, not exa exasperated, not fainting, not weak. He was as full when he came out of the battle as he was when he went into the battle. And that's where God wants us to be. We say they were all, be filled with the Spirit, but the scripture really says be being filled with the Spirit. It's a continuous inflow that there may be an overflow and an outflow. You know, these, <coughs> these two anointings were very different again. Sometimes read the constitution of the first one I read. Its, it's ingredients are very different from the ingredients of the second one. And the, uh, in these days of such fantastic research, I, I read recently there are no less than 16 million perfumes in the world that have been identified. We were in Neiman Marcus's just before Christmas, a lady passed me and she had them all on. <laughs> when she went past it was swish, <laughs> could hardly breathe, I thought. She didn't get it in Kmart, I'm sure. What a perfume, it was gorgeous. Sixteen million, can you imagine that? And they have all been identified. And one of them is so pungent that as little as at one five hundredth part of a milligram. Have you got that? The doctor will understand that. One five hundredth part of a milligram can fill fifty cubic feet of air until it's almost unbearable to breathe it. Well, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he hath anointed me. You know, I've come to this conclusion, I've got some preacher friends here tonight, that preaching without anointing isn't preaching, it's lecturing. If Jesus didn't preach without anointing, how in the world did I preach without anointing? This ointment could never be purchased. It could never be imitated. 
But let's take it down bit by bit here. Shall it not be poured? Notice it says, upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Do you remember what it says in Psalm 133? It says the anointing was put on the head of the priest like it was on the head of Aaron. And it says it ran down his head and down his beard and onto his clothes and onto the floor. He never touched his flesh. God never anoints flesh. The oil on his head, the oil on his beard, the oil on his body, but never on his flesh. Not on his cheeks, not on his hands. Upon the man's flesh it shall not be poured, verse 32. Neither shall he make any other like it, after the composition of it. It is holy and shall be holy unto the Lord. There can be no imitation. In Leviticus 10, God says you can't offer strange fire or imitation fire. In Exodus 20, he says you can't have a strange altar. It must all be according to the word of the living God, the measurements. You see, the first thing in that beautiful tabernacle, the measurements that were given, were given about the mercy seat. We talk about coming to the altar. In 1856, when William Booth founded the Salvation Army, he never used the term altar. He used to say, come to the mercy seat. They used to sing a song. <coughs> come ye disconsolate wherever ye languish. Come to the mercy seat, fervently kneel. Here bring you wounded heart. Here tell your anguish. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And you never went to that altar for two minutes. You didn't go kiss the... Today we've prostituted the altar. Come if you don't feel well. Come if you're frightened of living tomorrow. Forget it. The altar is for two things, all I know of. One is death and the other is sacrifice. And when he came to the altar there, immediately he knelt down. The Salvation Army lassie would put her arm around the girl that was there. The Salvation Army soldier put his arm around the fella. And they would read scriptures and take them step by step by step. You know, our thought come to the altar with 50 years of sin and it takes 50 seconds to get rid of it. The least emphasized aspect of the Holy Spirit's work today is conviction of sin. I'm going to preach to, I don't know, a thousand preachers and whatnot soon. I'm going to tell them. I believe the biggest enemy to revival in America today is evangelism. We've prostituted the altar. There isn't a man on TV preaching or radio hardly preaching salvation they're preaching other things there isn't time you'd have to go first of all you begin with uh, something that preachers don't know much about anymore don't check on these boys here they're smart prevenient grace when God started working in your life before ever you were born again of the spirit of God somewhere he intercepted you when you were going to step over the brink and go to hell and he, he just came in like that Somebody else got killed in a car crash, you missed it. That's prevenient grace. It's God's mercy when I, as a hymn writer said, I had long withstood his grace, long provoked him to his face, would not hearken to his call, grieved him by a thousand for... Is anybody here came to Christ the first time you heard the gospel? I've never heard of that except in heathen countries. Isn't it amazing how God watches prostitutes, our bodies... By that I mean waste our time, waste our efforts, waste our brains, and he doesn't interfere. But there's been a cut-off in our lives, and we don't realize that. No strange fire on the altar. No strange altars. The altar calls have got weird. I, I, I'm almost ready to vomit when I hear altar calls given these days. People used to pray, stay at the altar till in the old days. Brother Farrar remember this. He's getting on for 90. He's not there yet, but he's getting up there. <coughs> but you know, I remember when you went to uh, a meeting. I preached one night, would you believe it? I'm sure you will. I preached three hours and 20 minutes on the judgment seat of Christ. When I went to breakfast next morning, they said, you know, people were still at the altar at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock. They prayed through. They just let God work on them. We feel a little pang and think all the angels in heaven ought to come and heal us. There's no birth without travel. In natural spiritual birth you have conception, birth, you have conception, gestation and birth. I don't know one top line evangelist tonight that's prepared to go to a city and stay there five or six weeks. Last year I got invitation to go preach a jubilee service in a church I helped found 50 years ago. 
And then another invitation to a church, we found it 50 years ago. We went to a city with no money. We got a guy to lend us a tent till we had enough money to pay for it. We slept in the tent, we ate in the tent. We did our cooking in a little bell tent outside. We prayed in the tent, we wept, we groaned, we traveled. We stayed there eight weeks. Mr. Moody went to London and turned parts of London upside. What did he go for? Six days? No, sir, six months. Six, six months. He went to Scotland for six months. And there's a wonderful Bible school in Glasgow called the, uh, what do you call, BTI. Bible Training Institute. It came as a result of Mr. Moody being there for six, six months. They went to pull down strongholds. They didn't hit and miss him. There is no scriptural foundation for a one night stand in any city. Now I'll get into trouble for saying that with the preachers, but I'll say it. They want quick results. Oh, well, do you know how busy I am? Well, I, why are you telling me that Gabriel made your schedule and brought it down to you made the schedule? That's why you're busy. <laughs> Don't blame the devil. He gets enough blame. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. This anointing is the most precious thing on earth. It doesn't come by reason of age. It does come by reason of trial. What does it say? Okay. The Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee, take unto thee sweet spices. Stacti. That, that's actually, stacti is actually a kind of a gum that comes out of a, t a small scrubby tree, but it has fierce thorns on it. The peculiarity about this thing is that the only, it, it, the, the gum is taken from it in the night time, in the dark time. And not only is it taken out in the night time, but this, the tree has to be, someone has to slit in it to make that gum come forth. In other words, it's typical to me of the Lord Jesus because it's a tree with thorns. He went through the darkness of Gethsemane. He tasted all the bitterness. He tasted the anger of God because he says, it says in that prophetic psalm, all thy billows are gone over me. And you see, these things that make up this holy anointing oil, they're very costly, they're very rare. And if you're a candidate for the anointing of God, then this somewhere will come in your life. There'll be darkness. There'll be woundings. After all, it wasn't one of the 500. Jesus was seen of 500 brethren at once. It wasn't one of them that betrayed him. It was one of his closest friends that betrayed him. A man who had slept at the side of him. A man who had seen him raise the dead. A man who had seen him do miracles. And yet he could betray the Christ of God? You see, what's hurting Jesus Christ today isn't the sin of the world so much, it's the sin of the church. Blair Pascal was, I consider, maybe the most brilliant man that ever lived. By the time he was about 25, he ex exhausted all the sciences. I could tell you some details I want. He was a genius in the scientific world. And one day he said, I've tried them all and there's nothing in them. And he turned to Christianity, which he said religion, or the Christian religion, the theology of the Christian religion is the queen of the sciences. Well, if that's true, and I believe it is, then holiness is the crown on the head of that queen. <clears throat> you see, Jesus is only coming for a holy church. He's not coming for a bag woman. He's coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle. I've told you before how we went to the marriage of a daughter, of a millionaire's daughter. As she came down the aisle, the Lord said to me, look at this girl. I looked at her, she was blushing, and she had a gorgeous mantle of uh, lace from Brussels. She's inheriting millions of dollars. We'd eaten in her home, her father's home, on the front of the sea, in a yacht there, and everything. And I looked at that bride. And I said, oh, the Lord simply whispered in my ear, look at the bride. I've seen tall ones and small ones and fat ones and thin ones, rich ones and poor ones, wise and otherwise. But anyhow, here's this charming young lady. And the Lord said, but you've never seen a dirty bride. Again, you, don't, never, do you ever see a bride? I know these girls are fussy. I mean, exciting. Do you ever see a bride stand at the altar with curlers in her hair? Hmm? Oh, 
got mustard running around her dress. I was, oh, I was eating George. I'm sorry, George. I was eating a sandwich and the mustard ran out. <laughs> She's pure. Jesus is coming for a church, a pure church. And we're going to go through tribulation and trial to get there individually. Again, there were ten virgins. Why did they all go into the marriage? They're all pure. They weren't five harlots and five virgins. They were five, all pure. They had oil in their lamps, some of them, but not enough. And they shut the bridegroom, wouldn't open the door. They rapped on the door. And he said, I don't know you. I expect to see the dying thief at the marriage supper. I'm absolutely sure he won't be the bride. He won't be part of the bride. Well, I'll tell you what. Usually, the bride does carry some lovely perfume, doesn't she? And I believe this is typical of the adornment of the bride. But there's a first step, darkness, betrayal. Somebody stabbing me in the back or somebody doing some cruel thing that's not legitimate to you. What do we do when God starts to... We start crying. Oh, would you pray for me? I'm going through a rough time. The Lord says, listen, there'll be no perfume if you don't go through this thing. You go through it alone. You go through it in the darkness. In other words, what God is doing, he's making character. I used to think God was going to capture all the big preachers. Forget it, gentlemen. You're not even big preachers. But anyhow, apart from that... <laughs> Oh, I love them. They know I mean what I mean. <clears throat> but you see, I'm, I'm realizing now, a man may have an enormous ministry and be a dwarf. A moral dwarf and a spiritual dwarf. So the first thing is stacty that's taken from the tree in the night. An onica. What's that taken from? Well, the uh, scholars disagree, but they do say it's taken from a shell from the sea or it's taken from the claw of something like a crab or something that's in the sea but the perfume will not come out until it dies you see I don't know what's wrong with my life there's no perfume coming out of my life well die a lady said, a lady said a fabulous thing to me just a few days ago she, she, this lady said, when my mother comes in the room, I don't have to, she doesn't have to speak. I don't have to hear her steps. When my mother comes in, I know that for all the years I've known my mother, she always has the same fragrance. When we were singing tonight, this wonderful hymn, Holy, 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 I rejoice in the fact again that God is not capricious. He doesn't pull any tricks. All he's doing, whatever it is, it's as black as hell and it seems all hell has the hand that we sang tonight. When through fiery trial thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not harm thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The onica comes only after death. I was thinking today of a man, I haven't thought of him for many years, but his name was Barclay. He was one of the family that owned Barclay's bank in England. And there was an elegance about him, a, a distinction about him. Even when he walked on the platform, he didn't seem to walk like other people. When he smiled, he had a different smile. When he spoke, he had a different accent. His whole attitude had a fragrance of beauty about it. Some friends of mine were asked to go to his house for dinner and they thought, oh, it's great. Then a Rolls Royce pulled up and they weren't so happy. Yeah. There were no heaters in the cars in those days. And they sat in the car and they had a, a, a chauffeur and they had a footman. And this man took out his, uh, the, the chauffeur pulled up and the footman got out and he took a beautiful uh, fur and he threw it over the knees, over the legs of these people in the back of the car. They got to the mansion, when they got there, the, the servants there had knee breeches and white stockings and black shoes with big silver buckles. And the whole house was, had decorum and dignity. He's a very wealthy man, a banker anyhow. 
But you know, he lived on that level, not only socially, but he lived on that level spiritually. He was so gentle, he was so compassionate, he was so loving. You'd think that everybody in the world existed except himself. There was a grace about him. And you know, that same thing is true of the Lord Jesus Christ. A consistent grace. They wondered at the words that proceeded out of his mouth. If you have a gracious spirit, if, if the death has happened in your life, or if God has applied, shall we say here, this stack tea and this hanukkah, it will soon show up in your life and in mine. And it speaks here in the same verse, verse 34, about stack tea, hanukkah, and galbanum. Now the first one is collected in the night, in the dark. Galbanum is another tree, but it, it exudes its best early in the morning, in the joy of the morning. There's a scripture I was looking for it, I don't know where it is, if it isn't there it should be anyhow, but it is there somewhere. It says, None, nobody can go into the king's presence with a sad countenance. That's something. It doesn't mean you can't go when you're sorrowful. It means you can't go in there with a depression. Why doesn't the scripture say in his presence there is fullness of joy? And we mentioned that about eternity. It doesn't mean that. If I live in his presence now, I have fullness of joy. That doesn't mean I'm always on top. Happiness. It's not happiness. Happiness depends on happenings. Joy is independent of happenings. <clears throat> Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross? <clears throat> Tell me this, would you like, I don't know what age you are now, Mr. Farrar I know isn't 99 yet, but anyhow. Would you like at, at your age, what are you, 22, 23, if somebody said, look, I've got a book here, it's a prophecy, and the man who wrote this prophecy has never been wrong, and it tells you what's going to happen in your life at 22, and then at 25, and then at 29, and then at 30, and then at 40. And it's all getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally you're going to be humiliated, you're going to be dragged through a town, you're going to be nailed to a cross. How did Jesus read the book and continue the way that he was going? For the joy that was set before him. I love the old hymn that says, Go labor on, spend and be spent. Thy joy to do the master's will. It is the way the master went. Should not the servant tread it? Come on, why in the world do you expect better treatment from this lousy world than Jesus had? Are you super holy? Hmm? Did you slip out of heaven when Gabriel wasn't looking and you're, you're not normal? I know you're not normal, but apart from that... <laughs> Could we maintain our dignity? Could we maintain our testimony? Could we maintain our faith? There's a hymn that says, I know not what awaits me, God kindly veils mine eyes. I'd rather walk in the dark with God than walk alone in the light. Would I really? <clears throat> or as another hymn says, hidden in the hollow of his blessed hand. If I'm hidden in the hollow of his hand and he hides in the rock, what chance has the devil of getting to me? If I'm living in a place of obedience and submission to him, I should be able to defy the world, the flesh, and the devil. <clears throat> so you've got the stack team. You've got the onica that comes from the uh, fish or some, or some creature of the sea. And they say they get it from the claws, the hardest part, but it's very pungent. <clears throat> and galbanum that's collected in the morning. So you see you've got darkness and you've got light. And sweet spices and pure frankincense. Now frankincense is mentioned no less than 17 times in the uh, different ceremonies that uh, Israel had. But you see it has this power. If you, it's the main one in all this collection of different things. It's the main, it's the most powerful of the perfumes it actually ignites the other perfumes. As soon as they're touched with it, they, they develop a stronger perfume. <clears throat> Remember that in case of Jesus, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. It was given for royal people. You see, this, this anointing, it, it says in verse 32, there should be no other like it. <coughs> That 
verse was repeated again in verse 48 whosoever shall make like unto it to smell thereof there's no imitation there can be no imitation you can't have an imitation altar you can't have an imitation fire you can't have an imitation anointing what do we do? the imitation we have is to give men ordination the ordination and imit uh, ordination and the holy anointing are a million miles apart Sure, I got ordination, I didn't have any more sense. My ordination is in the Supreme Court in England is as good as the Archbishop of Canterbury is. What good is it to, to me? Does it make me a better preacher? No, it doesn't. You see, we use so many substitutes for the anointing of God. Education or inspiration. But not so. Organization. Personal talents. I've said in one of my books, we so often we mistake action for unction. We mistake zeal for anointing. We mistake uh, oratory for power. Or a meeting where there's noise. What a powerful meeting. Come on, that's not, that's not, that's not anointing. <coughs> the Spirit was upon him, anointed him. But look, when you've got all these ingredients together, they're difficult to get. You have to get up early in the morning to get one. You have to go through midnight to get the other one. You have to go to the sea to get the other one. You have to pay an exorbitant price to get them. Then it says what? Verse 36, thou shalt beat some of it very small. Isn't that great? The Lord says, I'll stop soon. You say, Lord, it's getting, I mean, I'm getting punched around, I'm going to be rotten to bits. He says, that's what I'm trying to get at. We say, Lord, take the price off. He says, I can't. Not if I'm going to produce that perfume, I can't do that. There's going to be a grinding, there's going to be a beating to get all these things to gel together and become what they should really become. You see, the Lord said he would meet with Aaron and his sons. You find that if you read chapter 29, for instance, or if you go back to 28, make a mercy seat, and there will I meet with thee. I, I was going to say I had a friend, I didn't have a friend, he's an acquaintance. He lives in the Bahamas, and he was called to the court in England to be knighted. Do you think he went in his suit and polished his shoes when he got to Buckingham Palace? Brother, he was excited for three months, he could hardly sleep. He's going to kneel before the Queen, she puts a sword on one shoulder and takes it over like that, and his name happened to be Leonard, it wasn't me. And she said, rise, Sir Leonard. And just that moving from there to there, he, becomes, he moves into a different realm entirely. But he bought the most costly suit he could. He wore everything of the very finest, he was excited about it. He was thrilled to get him to Buckingham Palace, even to look at the palace, but when he got into the courtroom, saw the Queen on the throne, all the rest of it, my goodness, he forgot all about the way he'd been trained for that. You know, God demands that of us. We rush into God's presence sometimes, and how to get down before we give him our shopping list. Lord, I need this today and that and something else. How often do we fall in speechless adoration? That's what worship is as far as I'm concerned. It's speechless adoration. John fell at his feet as dead. Why? Dear God. He'd lived with Jesus for three years. He'd slept with Jesus. He'd eaten with Jesus. And yet when he sees the glorified Christ of God, he falls dead. He's speechless. We need to learn more about that. It's a forgotten art. Worship is a forgotten art. And it is an art in the true sense in the spiritual life. But all these perfumes were on the Lord Jesus Christ. I, was, I read a thing about uh, the Song of Solomon. I've been reading it lately and I like it. I read something that Spurgeon said the other day. He said, some people read the Song of Solomon and say, this is just Solomon and his bride. He said, well, they're looking with one eye. And he said, some say, no, it's Solomon and his bride and Jesus and his bride. And he said, they're cross-eyed. But as some see it's just the Lord Jesus Christ and his bride, and he said they're, they're seeing it with a single eye. But it's so majestic, the speech that comes from the bridegroom is beautiful.
precious words, precious truths come from him. There's a fragrance. Even unbelievers said, no man ever spake like this man. But he was anointed. The Lord Jesus was anointed. For what? For service? For suffering? I was reading Lamentations chapter 2 today. Pardon me, chapter 1. Lamentations of Jeremiah. <coughs> Jeremiah, Lamentations chapter 1. Verse 18 says, The Lord is righteous, I have rebelled against his commandment. Here I pray you all people, and behold my sorrows. My virgins and my young men are gone into captivity. Verse 20, Behold, Lord, for I am in distress, my bowels are troubled, my heart is turned within me. I have grievously rebelled. Now if you go to chapter 2 and verse 11, you'll get something added to that. You know what I'm seeing here? This is a picture to me of an anointed man. He's not seeing with the natural eye, he's seeing with a divine eye. His inward ear is open to the voice of God. His eye has been anointed with divine eye salve. And he says in chapter 2 and verse... Uh, Let's take verse 11. Mine eyes do fail with tears. My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured forth for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Well, there you are. Here is a man who's internally torn up, let's put it that way. Unless he had an anointing from God, he could never stand this. He's no longer thinking rationally. He's no longer thinking like other men think. He's been brought into the very heart of God himself. And I don't see how a man can be brought into the heart of God and have the anointing of God without tears, without brokenness. We live in a broken world. Marriages are broken, children are broken, minds are broken with drugs, bodies are broken with disease, bodies are broken with alcohol. We live in a broken world and there's nobody can heal it but God. And his agency is the church of the living God and yet where are the servants? I don't see how a man can live and not weep. I couldn't anyhow. He sees the tragedy. He sees the brokenness. He sees the victory of the devil. He says men and women taken captive at his will. We know once a man gets into that anointing, once he gets into the place where the Spirit of God has come and touched him, and he's not thinking like other men think, he's not acting like other men, his values are all changed. I find it astounding. Why is America so dead tonight? You know, I, don't, I, I, I think I've got a good sense of humor. But I think jokes are out of place in a funeral parlor. I heard recently one of the great advantages now in the church, we've got spirit-filled comedians. They'll come to your church and they guarantee if they, uh, if they come, people will roll on the floor. So then you've got your holy rollers, you see. <laughs> They'll tell such funny... And they make it out of twisting scriptures. You've got some people now who make their faces white and their hands white. They go in shopping malls and, and say that they're presenting the gospel. Can you imagine... Come on, can you imagine men coming out of the upper room, Peter with his face like a wet, white mask and hands... Why in God's name do we advertise our bankruptcy? There's no mistaking holy anointing. There's no mistaking holy authority. There's no mistaking holy fire. The substitute is no good at all. It has to be God himself that does it. The cost is so great, isn't it? If Jesus had to say the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and he did, then dare I go anywhere, minister, without the anointing of God? You know, D.L. Moody was offended when two women told him he needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. They said, you're a good preacher, but you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Praying Hyde went to India and when he got out in the ocean he found there was an envelope on his bed in his stateroom 
and he opened it and somebody said you're a good man and you have great potential but you still need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and between leaving America and India the Lord met him in a marvelous way and the Lord gave him that awesome ministry of intercession I don't believe we can pray without the anointing of the Holy Ghost we can say words but if I want something from God's heart to my heart to your heart I've got to be very sure of my standing with the Lord Jesus Christ again the devil gets so often he gets charged uh, with stopping our prayers but I'm quite sure that we sabotage our own praying yes. we've unclean hands and impure hearts who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord he that hath clean hands and a pure heart only that one can pray and receive an answer from God we need to pray both now and after I trust you'll pray for this conference at Dave Wilkinson's well at least he has organized it if there are going to be 1200 people there it's 10 times the number that were in the upper room if the Holy Ghost falls out of the conference it could change the history of America if it doesn't it will be pep talks about repentance I don't believe in repentance without restitution I don't care who repents it doesn't take any spiritual or moral courage to kneel down and cough up a lot of things Lord I'm sorry about this sorry. but the scripture says confess your faults one to another if those men repent one night they should go back to the churches the next Sunday and stand in the, in the pulpit and confess everything publicly that they've confessed secretly to God otherwise they don't bring forth fruit meat for repentance but that means a broken heart it means a broken spirit it means I've died to public opinion that all I want is a supreme reality in my being that I have the anointing of God for the day in which I'm living yes. there's no hope without it there's no substitute for the oil if a man makes a substitute oil if we read further in the chapter it says put him to death that's pretty serious making an imitation imitation preaching, imitation anointing zeal what seems like authority strong words, gesticulations raising your voice, doing the other thing but they are no substitute I read a statement this week that really stuck with me a crucified leader demands crucified followers isn't that something? there are no the heart is so corrupt, so deceitful that until we really die to self and sin that fragrance can't come up out as that little song says within the veil did this beloved thy portion within the secret of thy Lord to dwell beholding him until thy face is glory thy life is love thy lips is praise foretell within the veil what is thank you within the veil his fragrance poured upon thee without the veil that fragrance shed abroad within the veil his hand shall tune the music which sounds on earth the praises of thy God within the veil thy spirit deeply anchored thou walkest calm above a world of strife within the veil thy soul with him united shall live on earth the resurrection life I know it's not the resurrection of that but it is the resurrection of life that Jesus had the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead quicken our mortal body <coughs> you've heard me say before I still say I'm tired of leaning amongst pygmies I want to see some mature men some strong men some men that pull down strongholds some men that are itching for praise and glamour and glory and projection that want to be hidden and lost and become the seed in the ground that dies and brings forth fruit to the glory of God it's not easy it's very costly but again in your life in that dark patch you're in now he's working everything after the counsel of his own will it's the first step maybe the other ingredients will come as we progress and we come to maturity it's not based on years it's based on obedience yes. there's no substitute for obedience Amen. to obey is better than sacrifice remember what Saul said I did, uh, I did what you told me to do I gave the best of the cattle, I did this, but I uh, just kept a few lame ones. No, no, I gave the whole lot, he said. 
Then some little sheep at the back didn't know any better and they bleated. So the prophet says, what meaneth the bleating of the sheep <coughs> and the lowing of the oxen in my near? It doesn't matter what facade we put up, somewhere if there's a sheep still alive it's going to bleat. Yeah. We're going to be found out. It's total obedience. Again, I do not believe that confession is a down payment for eternal life. There's much more than that. There's confession, there's forgiveness, there's repentance, there's restitution, and there's forgiveness. You know, eternal life, I, I take, is a quality of life which is God-given. Well, if I have eternal life, if I die a minute from now, which would shock you, I'm sure, but if I'm living now with eternal life, why should I need a change before I get into heaven? Eternal life, to use Skugel's word, is life of God in the soul of man. Is the life of God in me now? That's what John says. He that hath the Son hath life. I'm not a Christian because I confess my sin, because I've quit a lot of drinking and swearing and filthiness. I'm a Christian only when Christ comes to indwell in me and takes sovereign supreme control of my life. Amen. Amen. It was Augustine, I don't know which, there were two of them. One of the Augustines said, there's no sanctification in the sepulchre. I was turning over that word again today. It's very beautiful where it says in what is it, the 12th or 13th chapter of Hebrews that we now, in the flesh, we can be partakers of his holiness. Not after we die, now. He makes us holy and he sets us down in a, a wicked and perverse generation, a crooked generation, he calls it, amongst whom we shine. We walk in holiness. We walk with the life of another world. We walk with the intelligence of another world in that sense. Or illumination from another world. There's no sanctification in the sepulchre. I pity some of the preachers when they get to eternity. We're afraid to urge people into holiness because everybody wants happiness rather than holiness. And yet immediately two verses after it says we can be partakers of his holiness... It says, uh, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Because God has made full provision for us here to be holy. Well, you say, we sang tonight, only thou art holy. Well, sure, he has original holiness. Mine is borrowed from heaven or given by his mercy, given by his grace. But he is essentially, eternally, integrally, he's totally holy. And we can be holy because Paul prays in 1 Corinthians what is it, 1 Corinthians 5.23 or 4.23 Very God of peace, sanctify your holy, I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. The next verse says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. There's nothing heroic about being a sinner. You don't need guts to go to the devil. You don't need to be smart to drink. You don't need to be smart to go to the devil and, and get bad habits. Anybody can do it. Side two. Well, I guess it didn't say much tonight. I got more blessing preparing it. Thinking of these precious things, thinking of the darkness through which so many saints have gone. Yeah. I love Amy Wilson Carmichael. I think Paul has about every book that Amy Wilson Carmichael wrote. A frail little Irish woman went out to India, got a one way ticket, like missionaries used to do. For 30 years, she suffered with a curvature of the spine. In the last three years, she had to be lifted out in and out of bed two or three times a day. And yet it was that little woman that wrote, Give me a love that leads the way, a faith which nothing can dismay, a hope no disappointments tie, a passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. Here she is crippled on her bed, and she says, Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel flame of God. I used to have trouble with that scripture, the first should be last, the last should be, I have no trouble about that now. I think I were amongst the first up there around the throne there were people like Amy Wilson Carmichael. She never was on PTL, isn't that awful? 700 Club, never wrote a book, but she lived, her life was hid with Christ in God and the fragrance of her life traveled. People would go in the room and sense the presence of the living God. 
within the veil his fragrance poured upon thee without the veil that fragrance shed abroad within the veil his hand shall tune the music which sounds on earth God can take every bit of discord out of your nature whether it's a vile temper or secret lust it doesn't matter what everything which is in you which is antagonist to God God can take out I don't care how much you talk about depravity Paul said a statement the other day there that when Adam put forth his hand to take that fruit he turned darkness on yes he let every disease and foul devilish thing every jail in America every broken home is a result of what he did I was going to talk tonight I hope I didn't miss the Lord's mind I was going to speak on the potter and the clay the potter made it again a second chance God didn't give Adam a second chance what do these dumb preachers do they like to see people come to the altar these kids who are beaten with secret lust and they come to the altar Sunday and it satisfies the preacher he has a thirst to see an altar crowded how many times did Adam sin before he got kicked out of the garden why did Jesus say to a bad woman go and sin less sin no more at the other side of the cross men don't sin because they have to they sin because they want to men despise other men's sins and I went to other theatres in England he sang before royal family and he came and joined our touring group and he had a fantastic voice and he said he despised the sin of the other men they lusted for women I didn't he said I got off the stage I threw my tall hat over there my stick and I went and got drunk and every night in life they drove me home to the boarding house and I acted like a pig I vomited and the men would curse me the next morning I hated their sin they hated, hated my sin we have turned everyone to his own way but God can take the twist out of us and make us untwisted God. the impurity out of us and make us pure Amen. take our self will and put his will in us I love the old song the holiness folk used to sing sweet will of God still fold me closer till I am wholly lost in thee my stubborn will at last is yielded you know why the children are stumbling these days let me say this once and again and wrap it up Pompey married the uh, <coughs> who did he marry he married the sister of Julius Caesar she kept the balance between her husband and, and her father for a long while and then something blew up and somebody told Pompey that there was a country where God lived there was a temple well there were temples in Rome and Italy where he was but he said if you go to that temple there's a secret place in that temple where God lives he took the hazardous journey and eventually arrived in Palestine then Israel now and people heard and he went like a Roman conqueror riding on the horse he went up to the temple and they remembered what happened when King Uzziah went and what happened to him well he went through the outer court he went to the Gentile court he went through each court and then he got into the center of the temple the Holy of Holies and there was the curtain and he had some men take swords and slash it wide open and what was it? total darkness they told him God was there in the blackness God is there closeted and he expected some blazing light because he said God is light when he slashed that curtain in two he cried there's no God here there's no God there's no presence there's no deity there's no light there's no beauty and he was angry well I say now our kids come to church they come through the outer court which is a tennis court they come to the next court with the baseball court they come to the next court which is what uh, football court if you like and the next court they come through which is basketball the next court racquetball and they come in the temple and say God isn't here the less power a church has the more entertainment it has entertainment is the devil's substitute for joy that glory has to come back but it won't come back until men are anointed until we can't live 
and see a world go to hellfire and be unbroken, it will move our bowels, it will move our compassion, it will move our hearts, it will change our lifestyle. That's what God says anyhow. And I'm longing to see him do it. <coughs> I've been so impressed this week reading about well Henry Scroogle died at what? Before he was thirty nine, I think. I think he died at twenty eight. And Henry Martin wasn't much older when he died. And my great hero as a young man was a young American who died at the age of 28 as a missionary to the Indians. You've got a whole ro Robert Murray McShane in Scotland, the man who was so holy. They said he died conscious and he waved and he said, farewell mortality, welcome eternity. Mm -hmm. How many people die with an assurance and happiness to welcome the King Eternal Invisible, the only wise God? You see, what are young people looking for are people with character, people with dignity, people with authority, people who bring the living presence of the living God into the sanctuary when they preach. A man, a man, a man again, according to the old theory of the uh, Quakers, a man is his own, a man is his own uh, atmosphere. If that man comes in anointed, soon there will be something spread in the audience from him. If he comes in cold, the meeting freezes. It's an awesome thing to, for me to say, if I dare say to you, dare say, I'm filled with God. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll live a holy life. Number two, you'll be easy to leave with. Number three, you'll have the peace in Psalm 119. Great peace and nothing can offend you. And nothing can insult you. Jesus was never offended. I'm sure often, often he was distressed by the world around him. But he, nothing offended him. He came to do the will of his Father. And he tasted the bitter darkness. And he tasted the stabbing there in Gethsemane in the darkness. And out of his death there came the fragrance and beauty and wonder of redemption. And God is asking this of us. I think America at the moment is in the most critical situation she's been in in all her history. It's revival or revolution. I know Gaddafi said this week that Mr. Uh, Mr. Reagan now is the new Hitler. The boots on the other foot, Gaddafi is the new Hitler. He's an evil genius. He says he'll drop bombs on the main streets in Washington and maybe he will. But that won't bring revival. Only the Holy Ghost can bring revival. Only conviction of sin can bring revival. Yeah. Only true repentance can bring revival. Yeah. And everybody in this meeting, whether, if you're withholding your life from God, not your sins, you're told, if you want your sins, you want more than your sins, you want your life. If you are refusing God right, you're helping the enemy to destroy America. But we should be redeemed because he died for us. And he wants to make us new creations, give us new hearts and new spirits and new wills. Well, we're going to go to prayer. We have some sick, Brother Dale has been sick for two or three days. He's better today, much better. We don't sing. We used to sing, but we won't sing now to change. <coughs>